The title of this presentation is about affinity between SQL Cipher and Enroom Core data, and I would like to introduce Line's efforts to encrypt the database stored in smartphones. This is the agenda. After a brief introduction of why Line is working on database encryption and what SQL Cipher is used for encryption, I will introduce specific examples for Android and iOS. First of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Yudai Takanashi. I joined LINE as a new graduate in 2020, and I am in charge of developing the LINE Messenger Android app. In the Android part, I will talk about the case studies of the trouble that occurs when combining SQL Cipher and Room and how to deal with it. And I'm Bruce Evans, iOS engineer and I'm in charge of developing the iOS app for Line Messenger. Unlike Android's room, um, code data is very difficult to integrate with SQL Cipher, and today I will talk about its implementation. We believe that you are usually developing Android and iOS applications. I hope this session will help you to understand the importance of database encryption and the implementation of SQL Cipher. You may be wondering why do we need to encrypt the database? The most important point is to protect personal information. In some countries, if it is legally possible, the data may be requested, no matter how difficult it is. So we want to change the situation from difficult to impossible. Of course, LINE uses end-to-end -end encryption during communication, but all the data on the terminal is decrypted. Today's talk is about the unencrypted local storage. We are relying on the OS to encrypt the data, but for more security and peace of mind, we will protect the data of users before leaving it to the OS. Currently, we are using SQLite, so we chose SQL Cipher, which is built on top of SQLite interface. Now let me explain about the SQL Cipher. SQL Cipher is an open source library that extends the uh, SQLite database and provides encrypted local data storage with the same interface. It is designed to be tamper resistant using 256-bit AES Cipher and works cross-platform with iOS and an Android. Now, Let's talk about the Android case study using SQL Cipher. First, there are two main ways to use SQLite database on Android. The first is to use the low-level API that has existed for a long time in the Android database SQLite package. This is a powerful API that basically does everything you can do with SQLite, but it requires a lot of time and effort. The second way is to use Google's Android X Room, a library that uh, provides an abstraction layer for handling SQLite using annotation processing to generate code. Room reduces many of the uh, boilerplate steps required by the low-level API. The Android developer's documentation also strongly recommends using Room instead of the first low-level API. In the Line Android application, we use both methods, but we actively use Room when implementing new functions and refactoring. In this section, we will introduce some examples of problems that occurred when using SQL Cipher and Room together and how to deal with them. The linkage between SQL Cipher and Room is very simple. 
First, instantiate the support factory class provided by SQL Cipher with the uh, passphrase for encryption. Then, just pass the created support factory instance to the open helper factory of the boiler and that create the room data, room database uh, class instance and you are ready to use SQL Cipher. We have completed the implementation using SQL Cipher and released the app, but we found out that the crash occurs under certain conditions. The function that was causing the problem was a simple one like delete messages, which takes a list of IDs and then delete the row with that ID from the message table. The exception was occurring in the finalized method of the SQLite compiled SQL class and could not be prevented by Try catch. This is a very annoying problem that can happen in any Android app and is difficult to detect and then prevent it with automated testing in NQA. Before I talk about the cause of the problem, I will show you the versions of the libraries we are using. Room is 2.3.0 and SQL Cipher is 4.4.3, which is the latest stable version as of the uh, as of now. And the GitHub issue of SQL Cipher has already reported the problem presented in the session, and it seems that one of the causes of this problem will be fixed in the next version release. I will now discuss the cause of the problem that occurred, which was caused by both SQL Cipher and Enroom. First, let's talk about the cause on the SQL Cipher side. Before checking the cause, I will explain the class and the object. The first one, the SQLite statement class, is a pre-compiled reusable statement that is used for the queries uh, with results of one, such as returning the row ID of an inserted record or the number of row updated deleted. It is also used in the delete query that caused this problem. The second class, SQLite Compile SQL, is a capsule class for compiling SQL statements and releasing the compiled object. The third class, the SQLite 3 statement, is not the SQL Cipher class, but it is an object that represents a single SQL statement used by the native side. The relationship between them is shown in the class diagram on the right. The SQLite statement class manages the SQLite compiled SQL fields, and the native implementation of the SQLite compiled SQL class handles the SQLite 3 statement object. First, let's look at the release SQL statement method of the SQLite compiled SQL class. This is a method used to release the SQLite 3 statement object that exists in the native implementation. Call the native finalized method as implemented in native. The end statement that is checked in the first if statement is a field that holds a reference to SQL3 statement object. If this value is non zero, there is a valid SQLite3 statement object on the native side, so execute the contents of if statement to release it. The key is to lock the database being called before calling the native finalized method. This part is actually the source of the exception. To summarize the processing of the release SQL statement method, if there is a valid SQL3 statement object on the native side, if the release SQL statement method has never been called, it will retrieve the database log and then execute the release process. Next, we will look at the call to the release SQL statement method. There are two types of method calls that are relevant to this problem. The first is when the instance of the SQLite statement class is closed and we call the release SQL statement method of the instance of the SQLite compiled SQL class that we are managing. The second is in the finalized method of the SQLite compiled SQL class, just before the object is released by the garbage collection. 
The second call from the finalized method is the most important one, so I will look at it in detail. This is implementation of the finalized method of the SQLite compiled SQL class. As with the release SQL statement method, we first check to see if n statement is zero. If the release SQL statement has been called at least once, then n statement will be zero and we will return early. If the release SQL statement method has never been called, call it. To summarize, if an instance of the SQLite statement class is not properly closed at the time of a garbage collection when the final method of the SQLite compiled SQL class is called, it calls the release SQL statement method and tries to acquire the lock on the database. If the lock cannot be acquired for the long time, an exception will be raised, which is caused by SQL cipher. Next, let's look at the calls on the room side. On the room side, the cause was a problem with a code generated from a query with a specific condition. The condition was that the query had to be one of the insert, update, delete using query annotations. And the query had to use collection of arguments. Since the problem was in the code that generate a query by expanding multiple arguments at runtime, the problem doesn't occur when we simply use insert, update, delete. Now, let's look at the code generated from the definition of the delete message function. The generated code by Room looks like this. First, Prepare a query string that expands the placeholder to handle multiple arguments, and then compile. Bind the argument passed in the method call to the compiled statement, and execute the process in a transaction. The problem here is the release process of the SQLite statement class instance and a releasing process. The return value of the compile statement method is SQLite statement class if you are using SQL cipher. This class is implemented in such a way that the close method must be called after the usage is finished. However, in the finally block after executing the statement, the close method of the statement is not called. This is the room side of the problem, where the code generated from a query with a particular condition has a problem. Finally, we will summarize the causes of SQL cipher and a room respectively. From a query containing a certain conditions, room will generate a code that does not invoke the closed method. When the closed method is not invoked, the instances of the SQLite compiled SQL class will perform a release operation in the finalized method. During the release process, if the database log cannot be retrieved in time, an uncaught exception could be thrown. I will now talk about how we fix the problem in the Line Android application. As I mentioned in the first slide of this session about the version of the library, there is a high possibility that some of the issues will be fixed in the future updates of the SQL Cipher. Therefore, we decided to use workarounds until the library fixes the problem. We consider two types of workaround, and I would like to introduce them to you. The first one is to use the low-level API instead of room, and the second one is to use row query annotation instead of query annotation. The first way, using the low-level API, is simple. Replace only the queries in the generated code that cause problems. Since the room data class can get an instance of a supported SQLite database from Open Helper, we can use it to use the low-level API. The problematic delete message function can be replaced with an implementation that uses the delete method, such as the workaround function. The advantage of this approach is that the code is easy to understand. Many developer knows low-level API. The disadvantage is that you need to pass an instance of the room database class to the workaround function. 
If you are using DI to inject only the DAO class, you will need to rewrite the caller to use the room database instance to some extent. Another disadvantage is that you cannot enjoy the benefit of room code generation. You will need to explicitly switch the execution thread to a worker thread using the which context with context function and manage transaction appropriately. The second method, using row query annotations instead of query annotations, is to use row query which does not cause any problems in the generated code. For example, the code generated by room from the definition of the getValue function with row query annotation like this uses the cursor instead of SQLite statement class to generate the code. The close method of the cursor will also call the release SQL statement method of the SQLite compiled SQL class, so the release will be handled properly and no problems will occur. However, there are two things you need to be aware of when using row query. The first point is about the arguments of functions using the row query annotations. Row query can be defined as a function that takes a single argument of type support SQL like query, but it does not perform any verification at compile time. Therefore, the getValue function is supposed to receive a query that returns a value of type int, but as shown in the image below, even if the getValue function is given the completely unreleased query, then it will still compile successfully. This is very dangerous because it will result in an error or return an undefined value at runtime. Fortunately, functions that use the row query annotation can also specify classes that implement the support SQLite query interface as an argument types. In this example, the workaround2 internal function is a function that handles the query, and the delete message query class is an implementation of the support SQLite query interface for the workaround2 internal function. Also, by wrapping the row query function and exposing it outside of the DAO, such as in the workaround2 function, we can use the same argument and return value as the delete message function. In this way, the impact on the caller is minimized. The second thing is to keep in mind is the return value of a function that uses row query annotations. The return value must be non void type or a non unit type in Kotlin. In fact, the Android developer's documentation, it says to use the query method of the room database class instead of raw query if you don't want to return the value. However, this does not mean that the raw query can never be used for queries that do not return a value. Although it is not a well-behaved code, it can be solved by setting the return value of the function using row query annotation to nullable, which is an appropriate type that can be handled by room. In this case, I used a nullable in type. Looking at the generated code, we can see that move to first method of the cursor return false, no if the cursor is empty. Therefore, there is no runtime error because the query of delete passes in is consistent with the resultant value. However, this is a writing style that relies on room's code generation, so it should be comment or the function should be wrapped so that the return value cannot be handled. You can enjoy the advantage of room code generation using this method, and it can be implemented with the same arguments and return values as the delete message function. The disadvantage is that you need to pay attention to the two arguments and return values when handling row query. Also, row query is not well known implementation method, so the code may be a little difficult to understand. After comparing the pros and cons of these two methods, we decided to use second row query annotation instead of the query annotation in the workaround for the line Android application. 
The reason is that the ability to maintain the arguments and return values of public DAO function will reduce the cost of applying and removing the workaround. Also, the disadvantage of using role carry is acceptable because the problem is likely to be solved by SQL Safer in the near future. Finally, let me summarize the Android side. We should use Room rather than Role Level API as much as possible. In that case, with the current version of Room and SQL Cipher version, there are exceptions that cannot be caught when certain conditions overlap. In order to deal with this problem, we decided to use Role Query as a workaround. The next slide will talk about the iOS side. Evans, floor is yours. Let's talk about the iOS side from here. Line has been using core data for a long time, and a lot of code depends on core data. Core data, like Room, Android Room, is a high-level, persistent framework, but it is exclusive to Apple. I will introduce setup, database creation, ID change, search, storage, and data operation. First of all, core data does not have support for encryption, so we have to start from scratch, and we have to add encryption mechanism. This is the basic form of core data. The NS managed object context is the part that programmers usually use. Since object and entity are in this layer, it can be considered as the main function of core data. The NS persistent Store coordinator is a layer that manages multiple stores. NS persistent store is a closed set to row SQL right at the file store level. Now let's subclass NS persistent store, but before we do that, let's look at how to use it after we subclass it. This code connects a custom MySQL store to core data. First, we need to register the MySQL store. This is similar to UI collection view where the MySQL store class is associated with a strong ID. This is similar to UI collection view in that it ties the MySQL store class to string ID. This code can be placed anywhere, but it must work before core data is up and running. Let's get core data up and running. There are two things to note about this. First, use the string ID that you just registered at the type of the NS persistent store's description. This is very important. If you forget this, you will not be able to use any of the subclasses you have created. Next, since we are using SQL Cipher, we need to add the password option. This is core data as usual. Don't worry about where to call it or what object to use. Now that we have core data ready, let's get SQL Cipher ready. The linking of SQL Cipher is described in details on the SQL Cipher site, so I will not go into too much detail here. However, the following two points are very important to keep in mind. First, SQL Cipher does not work with SQLite, so you need to link it instead of SQLite. Second, link of flags. If it does not work with Swift, probably this is causing a problem. Now that the preparation is over, we can finally create subclasses. We will implement it as shown in this slide. The basic action is to prepare the data with these five functions, load metadata, and execute with to retrieve and store it. The two new value functions are used to change the data read from the database to NS managed object and obtain permanent IDs for uses the database primary keys to create NS managed object IDs. Let's take a look at load metadata for now. Load 
Metadata is called when core data is started. Finally, it is time to set up the store. There are three main tasks. The first one is to open the database. The second task is to use the database password to create a composite. The second task is to use the database password for compositing. It reads the password added in the options. Change it to data and pass it to SQL LCIFR as a byte pointer. Finally, we need to set the metadata as a name. Load metadata implies the basic values are these two. The unique key is directly from NS persistent store and type is a string ID from Maria. Next, we need to create the database. Next, which is basically a table of all the entities in the managed object model. So for each entry, for each entity, we need to create separate tables, relationships, and indices. First, let's create the entity table. This table is a pretty standard SQLite table that maps entities' properties to columns. First, we need to specify the primary key of the table. This can be a namespace collision, so be careful with the name. Next, chain the attribute of the entity to a column. In attributes by name, you can use a string, NS attribute description dictionary, and use key as a column name, and attribute type is used to determine the secret light type. Then there are entity relationships. There are two types of relationships in core data, to one and to many. Too many is a bit special, so we will create a separate table for it. The to one can be added here. However, you can save it by object. Instead, we will use a primary key from area. We can stop here, but since core data uses subentity, let's add subentity. Core data uses subentity, so let's add subentity. If we call the current function with recursive, we don't need to write any code. It can be very easy. Now that we have all the information in the columns, we can execute create and the entity table is complete. Next, we need to store too many somewhere, so we need to create another table with the rows of this table, one for entity and one for relationship, and combine the rows to create a list of too many We've already used to one. This is most important, so let's filter it down to only to many. And when we are done with the table, we need to think about the sub entity case again. But this time, instead of adding to the same table, we will create a new table. Finally, let's add an index. The entity has a list of index which is quite helpful. Use NS fetch index description to see which columns are to be indexed. Also, since we are using the same table, the sub-entity is treated the same. Now, we are done creating the database. After creating the database, we need to map the primary key. This is 
a simple implementation, so I will not go into detail. What is most important is to find the primary key. Add one and use it as a base ID. The new object ID for reference object is implemented in the subclass, so you only need to call it. The search and save operations all go through the same function. This may seem a little strange, but it is a Apple's API, so it can be helped. Since NS predicate request is a superclass, it is possible to distinguish between retrieval and storage depending on the type of subclass. For retrieval, it is NS fetch request, and for saving, it is NS save change request. Let's take a look at search method first. Unfortunately, there are four more types of fetch request. But the basics are not so different. Return an array to all. So in the case of count result type, it returns an array with only one element. The others are in the form of one object per element. There is not enough time to show all of the searches, so let's look at managed object ID result type. First, let's select the primary key that we just created. From here, while we have the result, we will loop through it to read the ID for the database. We can't use this ID as is, so we will change it to NS managed object ID through new object for reference object. Now all we have to do is to return. So the search is complete and all that left is to save it. In this case, there is only one type, but the type contains three tasks. Fortunately, they are all similar, so I will concentrate on insert today. By the way, there is one strange line. This last return is an empty array. The return type is not optional, and according to Apple's documentation, it expects an array for now. Let's look at insert. This is very similar to the database creation, however, this one is a bit more difficult because we want to get the value of the attribute, not just the attribute. First of all, uh, this is a little more difficult. You need to prepare the primary key of the database, so prepare it first. Then match the column name with the name of each property. The value is a bit trickier. Attributes can be used as is, but relationship is an NS managed object and cannot be used directly in the database. In this case, we ignore too many, but in reality, we need to filter it as well. But it is somewhat difficult to enter. To into the slide. Now that the search and save is complete, let's try it doesn't work. It returns only fault, so we have to read fault properly. There are two functions for this. There are two functions such as new value for object with width and new value for relationship for object with width. To put it simply, new value for object with width extract the attributes and new value for relation for object with width extract the relationship. Let's look at attribute first. There are two main steps. Here, we take the name and type of the column. We ignore the relationship completely. 
we can do this with new value for relationship for object with with, which makes this step much easier. Once the query is implemented, we need to map the values. We don't have to do anything special, but we have to handle each type according to SQLite API. So it's a pretty big switch. However, once that's done, all we have to do is to create a st store node and return. The relationship is easy. One point that is tricky though is the return type of this any. In fact, you can return three types for a to one relationship, return ns now or ns manage object ID. And for a to many, return an array of ns managed object IDs. Not only the return types, but also the implementation is different, so let's separate to one and to many. In the case of to one, it's simpler than the previous attributes. Just take the relationship from the main entity table and change it to ns managed object ID. Since it is the same type every time, there is no need for a big switch we saw earlier. Note that the SQLite API returns 0 for no int, so 0 is not allowed as a valid ID in this implementation. Too many is similar to to one, but the select is a little different because the database is different. It also includes dip because it is multiple, but other than that, it is exactly the same as to one. Now, a simple store is created. There are many things that are missing, but if you're interested, please contact me via SNS. I'm happy to talk with you. Today, I talked about why encrypt the database and what is SQL Cipher used for this purpose, followed by problems with Android and working around. And finally, how to make iOS and encrypted core data. Thank you very much.